Good morning, and thank you for joining us at Emmanuel Baptist in Victoria for worship on this Sunday, June the 14th. We're excited today to be starting our five-week teaching series with Amanda Ross and Ken Badley. If you received a bulletin, you will see that across from the order of service is a list of questions that you can be pondering as you're listening to the sermon. And we will be discussing these questions in our small groups this week. If you're interested in joining a small group, you're still quite able to do that, please call the office or email one of the pastors for information. And now as we turn our hearts and minds to worship, I'd like to read from Luke chapter 1, verse 78 and 79. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Merciful God, we come together to worship, longing for tenderness, because this world can be hard. We come longing for light, because our lives are crowded with shadows. We come desperately needing direction. Fill us this morning with your peace. Your spirit is our peace and our path. Amen.
good to hear. Um, Elno, would you like to play with me? Oh, yes. Wonderful. Want to go in the backyard and paint some rocks? Oh, yes. Okay, let's go. Um, I want more friends. Me too. I'm going to phone a friend so they can join us. Oh, wonderful. Ring. Hello. <gasps> Gracie, is that you? Yeah. Hi, Mr. <gasps> Stilson. my paws right now. Okay, I'll be there soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, I got one inside. I gotta go wash my eyes. I'll be right back. squabbles once in a while or little disagreements that you can still be friends. Really? Yes. Oh! Wow! Yeah! Hmm! So that means if you said something that you shouldn't say that your friend can forgive you. That's good. And what could you say, Bristleson? Well, you can say sorry. That's a good thing to say to a friend. Yeah, because that shows them that you love them too. Yeah, that's right. So why don't we thank God now that he gives us good friends? Okay. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. That's it. Dear God, thank you for friends. Thank you that you let us make our bubble a little bit bigger to have another friend in it. Help us to stay safe. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yay. Yay. Thanks for coming over today, Gracie. I had a lot of fun. So did I. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. I'm glad we're bubble buddies. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye, friends.
Good morning, everyone. It is good to be here with you, at least in spirit. Please join me in a time of prayer and a time of silent prayer. Father, together we open our hearts to you. We acknowledge that you are the one true God, the creator of all things, the one who has inspired the construction of hospitals and schools, centuries of great art, music that moves us to tears, and laws that free those who are marginalized. You have inspired the sharing of wealth, hope in the face of adversity, the desire to serve, and the commitment to do what is just. Thank you for what you inspire. I invite you now in silence to give thanks for something you know God has inspired. Lord, we know that you are God. We know that we are your people. We read that when Nehemiah long ago reconstructed the Jerusalem wall, there was a desperate need for diverse gifts of service. That need remains with us. Our prayer is that we be a people who recognize that everyone is needed. We recognize the task is to engage others in our local community our city, our country, and the entire world in such a way that all peoples will be blessed. Prepare us for this. Now, in silence, pray for a country in need other than our own. Lord, we know there will be times of adversity and uncertainty. We pray that this will not stop your work. Some of us come today with heartache, lingering grief, broken dreams, poor health and loneliness. Prepare us to embrace and walk beside one another. May we find reassurance in knowing that you are near, that we are cared for, and that we are valued. Prepare us for this. And now in silence, pray for someone you know who needs support. Lord, these are truly uncertain times. The people of many nations are now in the middle of a pandemic. Many have died and many more will become very ill. We pray that the vulnerable will be protected. Prepare us for this so we might do what is in the best interests of our neighbor. Perhaps it is as simple as washing our hands or staying home if we don't feel well or avoiding large gatherings, or sharing our resources. Prepare us for this. Now in silence, pray for our healthcare workers and people doing research. Lord, you have called on us to seek justice for widows, orphans, the sick, the poor, the disfigured, and those who are ethnically different from us. 
Amazingly, the longing cry for justice has within a few days swept around the world. We know about justice. You have set its requirements in our hearts. May we be responsive to those who cry out for equality in opportunity, in fair pay, in housing, in clean water, in health care, in respect, and in the eyes of the law. Prepare us for this. And now, in silence, pray for the indigenous peoples who first populated the land we are on. Lord, there are those who rely on fear-mongering, weapons, arrogant talk, name-calling, and intimidation to get what they want. We ask that throughout our world you would raise up men and women who would seek to be leaders because they love peace. May they be people who forgive easily, negotiate with respect, and are motivated by seeing others thrive. Prepare us for this so that we speak the truth, advocate for those in need, and are generous with our resources. Prepare us for this. Now in silence, pray for a local, national, or world leader. So, Lord, as we build and strengthen our ministries, our prayer is that we imagine structures with open doorways and expansive windows so that we reach out to go out to, draw in, and be with those who have yet to discover and experience the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the energizing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for having us here. I'm Amanda Ross. This is Ken Badley. And we are excited to join you for these next five weeks as we explore this moment that we find ourselves in as a society and how Christians can respond. Um, so we might as well get going here. Ken, why don't you tell us about why we started the book or tell, tell our folks about why we started the book where we did with the rise and fall of Christendom. Yeah, one of the metaphors we're using in the book is that of moorings, the way boats tie themselves up. And our question is, as a culture, what have we moored ourselves to historically? And of course, the answer, the very short answer to that is, well, to Christian faith, at least in Western society. And then what are we mooring ourselves to now as a society uh, in the 20th century? And then, of course, since the turn of the century, where have people tried to moor their lives? So that's, uh, that's been sort of the metaphor we've worked with in the book. And you will hear that sometimes in these next few weeks as we work with you, as we ask. So as Christians who move our, ourselves, our lives in Christ, uh, how do we uh, carry on in the society we're in? So that's, that's sort of the background. And I'll actually start right in on asking about the, the old moorings that uh, are at least uh, European Western society uh, anchored itself in really for a, a probably a thousand years or more. Yeah. And that starts in the 400s, in the fourth century, uh, with uh, Constantine, Roman Emperor Constantine, converting to Christian faith the night before an important battle and uh, in 312. And a year later, he decided to legalize Christianity. And then his successor, uh, five years later, made it not just legal, but made it the official religion of the Roman Empire. Of course, the Roman Empire didn't last that long afterwards, but uh, Christianity was now, the, in a sense, the official religion, the state religion of Europe. This may have reached its uh, zenith in what is usually called the Holy Roman Empire, so that in, on Christmas Day in the year 800, it was actually the Pope who crowned Charlemagne 
a king or emperor of the Roman Empire. And the thought today in, in 2020 of a, of a church person uh, ordaining, uh, say, the Prime Minister of Canada is just beyond our belief. But in 800, that was the status of the church. It was, in, in a sense, in charge of things. Well, uh, the Holy Roman Empire didn't last forever. Uh, it was sort of whittled away on for several hundred years, and finally uh, Napoleon ended it completely. But meanwhile, this whole period from about 400 to maybe 16 or 17, 1800, uh, Christianity was the dominant force in Western culture. And even if people didn't always uh, obey uh, Christ's precepts or pray or attend church regularly, it officially at least was the, the main shaper of people's lives. And so this period of time, which is often referred to as Christendom, or the set of arrangements, which is called Christendom, really lasted for uh, probably 800 or 900 years uh, minimal, and maybe a thousand or some would say 12 or 1300 years uh, informally. And of course, from the 1600s on uh, until today, uh, this, uh, the Christian influence on society has been diminished. And so that today uh, we still, for example, uh, enjoy income tax deductions for charitable donations to our church. But that's an exception. Church properties are not taxed. In three provinces, Ontario, British, uh, sorry, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, Catholic schools are funded. So there are remnants of this period of time. But for the most part, secularization has meant that Christianity is now sidelined in society. Uh, if you think about the last three months with uh, COVID, uh, there have been church people calling for national days of prayer, but for the most part, Canadians have not looked to the church for an answer to the pandemic. We look to other things. And so this place that our culture, at least Western culture was moored for a thousand or more years um, is gone. Uh, the church, the culture that we live in no longer looks to the church or to Christ or to Christian faith uh, for the foundation of its life, to moor its life, to use the language that we use in the book. So that's sort of the background to the work that we're going to be doing uh, with these weeks, in these weeks. And uh, the word Christendom might be familiar to some and not familiar to others, but it's, uh, by it we simply mean this period of time or this set of arrangements by which Christian faith kind of dominated Western society. So I turned it back to Amanda after that flying review of Western history. Uh, never before has a thousand years been treated in four minutes. So uh, we'll turn back to Amanda now. Yeah, it's amazing to think back about how much has changed for Christianity in, in those thousands of years. And I was trying to think of um, a biblical example of somebody or some culture who who underwent that sort of radical transformation, you know, from this powerhouse who could make all the rules to suddenly, well, we're, we're Christians, but we don't necessarily have a very loud voice in our society. And I thought actually about the history of the people of Israel. You know, at one time, they did know what it was like to be the people in power when they, they had their kingdom. And you know, there was that, those wonderful years with David and Solomon when Israel was just all that and they were able to make their culture the way they wanted to but you know they they didn't actually stay that way for a very long time it didn't take you know it took a couple generations but eventually the the northern half of israel was um, overtaken by assyria and then the southern tribes were taken away to babylon where they lived in exile for 70 years and there, they were in what we could call an unprecedented time, you know, away from their homes and their old normal. And they had to figure out what it meant to be God's people and to live in ways that are faithful to God, even though they were surrounded by people who didn't understand them at all. A whole culture with other assumptions, other rules, other ways of being. They were certainly, if, if we used to have a Christendom, I don't think you could call it an Israeldom, that's probably not a good word, but they had a kingdom and they lost it. Um, much more dramatically, perhaps, than the way that we've lost Christendom. But I think there are some, some lessons there that we can learn even from Israel's attempt to live as God's people in this foreign land. You know, we, we haven't been torn from our homes geographically, 
and we thank God there's no armies coming for us. And you know, there, there are certainly people in the world who live in that reality right now where they are torn from their homes and there are people coming for them. But we do, and we pray for those people and we hold them in our hearts for sure. But we do live in a culture that's changed. And certainly the fall, rise and fall of Christendom happened slowly over a long period of time. But our world began to change even more rapidly, I'd say, in the last hundred years. And that's where the next section of our book actually um, looks at. Perhaps we might call it the uh, period of, from Christendom to sec secularization. Can you tell us a little more about that, Ken? Yeah, so the chapter uh, that we're working from with this uh, today's comments is uh, trying to deal with where we are now. And uh, again, you know, we both live in Western Canada. Uh, I lived in the United States for eight years, but we're Canadians and uh, we're very typical in many, many ways. And so as we look back uh, through our two lifetimes, mine's roughly twice as long as Amanda's, but we look back on what are the the forces that have been at work in our lifetime and uh, where have people ended up because of those forces. And so Amanda used the word secularization. And uh, of course, uh, people have traced this uh, even right back to the Protestant Reformation when what was the Western church uh, became two churches. And of course, the Western church was already divided from the Eastern church. And there are people who argue that once you protest once, once you become Protestant, you will be protesting forever. And so the idea that we would have now 45,000 denominations in the world, uh, some have argued is actually a form of secularization. Um, but a more practical example might be, I remember uh, living in Regina when Sunday opening became an issue in the 1970s and Canadian Tire led the way uh, in Regina at that time. And I remember, uh, my wife and I discussing the need for Canadian Tire to be open on Sunday because we don't think people will buy more lawn seed if the stores open seven days instead of six. And yet there was this argument that, we, that people have the right to be open on Sunday. And of course, there are still places such as New Zealand and Germany that are closed on Sunday. And uh, so this is a, an example of secularization in our own country. Or the removal of the Lord's Prayer from school classrooms, for example, is another uh, example that one's more uh, well known in the US, but most Canadian school districts have followed the example and said uh, it's not the business to pray a Christian prayer in a public school classroom. So we see these examples all around us. And, uh, and our interest then is so what do people tie themselves to when secularization does its work? And uh, what we try to deal with in the project we're working on is uh, we look at four things particularly uh, democracy and uh, science and education and market economies. And these in, in the last 50 or 60 years, we've seen a great number of people tie their hopes to this. And I think, for example, when the Soviet Union broke apart in 1989 and 90, there was great hope among Canadians, for example, that uh, these countries in Eastern Europe that had been under Soviet domination would emerge to be wonderful functioning democracies. And of course, a majority of them have done that and others have fallen back into authoritarianism. I'm thinking of Hungary and now Poland and certainly Russia itself. Um, and so this hope for democracy has turned out to be uh, somewhat ill-grounded and likewise market economies, uh, which uh, in the 1990s, uh, people thought, well, as the world moves toward democracy and toward uh, capitalism, uh, the wealth will be, uh, more wealth will be created and it'll be spread equally among uh, the world's population. And it turns out more wealth has been created in market economies, but inequality is at the highest level it's been at since the 1930s. And so likewise with science or education, of course, science has produced some amazing things by which we benefit in our lives, but it has not been an unmitigated good. And I think, for example, a plastic and we, uh, now know that we have plastic inside our own bodies because micro particles of it are in the water. And uh, so uh, it was plastic was an amazing invention. And now we don't know what to do with it. And of course, uh, living in Victoria, you're probably aware more than those of us in Calgary of the so-called Pacific garbage patch, which is this massive pile of plastic in the middle of the ocean. And uh, what do we do with these things? So science is good, 
but science has some downsides. And so we looked at, at some of these areas that people have sort of put their faith in or tried to moor their lives to in the last 50 or 60 years. And undoubtedly, the world is a better uh, place than it was 60 years ago. But there are many people who have fallen through the cracks and have not benefited uh, from these things in which we placed our trust. So that's, that's sort of, uh, a, I gave a four minute history of uh, European, uh, a summary of European history, and this is my four minute summary of the last 50 years. So I'll turn back to Amanda now, who wants to take us back into Israel's history. Yes, well, one of the questions we keep asking in our, our book is, okay, so this is the way things are, now what? How can Christians respond? And so we like to look back to the Bible for, um, you know, considering answers for that sort of question. How do Christians respond now that we're in this culture where a bunch of hopes have really not proven as fruitful as we wanted them to? And we need moorings. We need something to hang on to. And of course, the answer for Christians is, is God. But, but what does that look like? So I'll go back again to, to Israel in this foreign land. And one of the ways that God continued to reach out to the people of Israel, even in exile, was through the prophets. God had warned them through the prophets again and again before the exile, you know, you're going the wrong way. Turn and live. Do what's right. And Israel didn't. And, and they, they suffered the exile. But even in exile, God called out to them again because God had not given up on their good future. And I think that's, that's quite an encouraging thing, that God doesn't give up on God's good future for God's people. One of the passages I, I appreciate the most was written to a people, to the people of Israel in exile, and it's from the book of Isaiah. You find it at the beginning of uh, chapter 55. I just want to read this invitation that God gives to his people in the middle of this, this changing and tumultuous time that they find themselves in. It says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. And as I was thinking through this passage, I, I noted three different calls that God gives to the people of Israel at this time. And the first is that invitation to come. That even though they're in this, this changing world, this world that doesn't look like what they had expected, that they have a small voice in. God says, my banquet is bountiful and all are welcome to it. It's a free banquet. And we'll find even as you, you flip the page and you keep reading that God's banquet is open to people that are normally not invited to anything. In their time, it was the, the foreigners in the eunuchs. And people who were excluded and who, thought, who were thought to have no value in society are actually welcomed to God's banquet. And we find out, too, that God is actually the source of true satisfaction for all their hungers and their thirsts. Verse 2, God says to the people to ask themselves these questions. Why are you spending your money and your time on things that are actually not satisfying, things that are actually not worth it? I imagine Israel perhaps, you know, spinning their wheels in the mud, going nowhere. They're not getting a good return for their labor. They're working, they're working very hard, but what's coming back to them isn't God's bounty. And it's a simple sort of question, like if God's ways lead to God's banquet and there is no banquet, then have we really been going God's way? And there's an invitation in here for the people to repent again. But not just to repent, but there's also a promise for forgiveness. If you look down a couple of verses uh, in chapter 6, it says, I mean, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. 
and to our God, where he will abundantly pardon. And it's not just that Israel needs to question you, know, have we been spending our time and money on the things that matter the most? But also, if we find the answer to that question is no, if we haven't been spending our time and money on the things that matter the most, there's an invitation to repent and an offer of abundant forgiveness. That God is, this invitation from God is not condemnation, but a promise of forgiveness. So God asks them to come. Then he asks them to ask themselves good soul-searching questions. But God also invites them to listen. Because listening to God will bring them into the good life, what is truly the good life. Because hearing God is the pathway to life for the soul. And we could ask, why? Not just because, you know, I obey God and God throws blessings on me, maybe. But because obeying God, doing righteousness, doing good is what makes life good. And we find out a couple chapters later in Isaiah that it's not just for the people of Israel, but doing good means also sharing their bread with the hungry, bringing freedom to oppressed people, clothing the naked, and bringing the homeless into a home. So the good life isn't just about blessings coming in, but it's about going out and living well and bringing good wherever God's people go. And I think... If I look at this example from Israel, I can hear also an invitation for us. And I see much of this in the life of Jesus as well, because he also invited people to come to him. He also is the water of life and the bread of life. He is the one who went out and found all the poor and the least of these in his society, and he brought good to their lives. And he invited everyone to come to find life, to listen to him and live. And these are invitations, I think, that God gives to God's people even today in the situation where we find ourselves in. We're not the ones in power anymore. And we certainly can't predict the future. Our pandemic has definitely reminded us of that. But we can look to God, first by coming to God. We recognize that our truest satisfaction is in God. And not in necessarily the other things that we've tried to moor our lives to. And we have this invitation to ask ourselves, have we really been spending our time and efforts on the things that matter most? Has our church been spending its time and its money on the things that matter the most? And if not, are we going to be willing to listen to God, to turn to God's way and to find life there, to live out that good in the world? by listening to God. And I hope, hope that we are, but it's quite a challenge. But perhaps if we do come to God, ask these good questions and, and listen carefully, that we will become people who are able and willing to work towards the life that is good. And we mean truly good for everyone. So I think we're hoping through this project in these next few weeks that Ken and I together and through this book and your small group studies that we'll really be able to ask good questions of ourselves, of where we are as people right now, where our culture is, but where we also are personally and as Christians and as Canadians and how to truly live as God's people, even in the midst of challenging times. Yeah. Do you have more to say, Ken? Uh, no, but thank you, Amanda. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church, for having us this morning. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
Amanda for sharing with us today and we look forward to them coming back next week for a second in a series of five sessions. We also like to remind you of your opportunity to give to the ministries of the church. There's three ways in which you can do that through the DEF program, which is an automatic withdrawal system, through online e-transfers, and thirdly through your offering envelopes, which can be mailed to the church or dropped off at the church office. And now I'd like to read the benediction for you from John chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. May God bless you this week.